Welcome to CFAM Family Worship Service. We're glad that you could join us this morning to worship our God together. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 103, verses 20 through 22. Bless the Lord, all you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let's pray. Father, we want to bless your name, and we want to thank you for being good and faithful throughout the week, even when we have failed to be good and faithful to you. But Lord, you have sent us your son Jesus to make a way so that we may still be accepted, loved, and cherished, and we are loved by your sight, so we are able to come to your holy presence to worship you and exalt you. So, Lord, we come with gratitude and joy, and we're thanking that, Lord, all that you have done through your Son. So, Lord, may you guard our hearts. May you help us to come with reverence, uh, with a sense of joy and gratitude, and help us to worship you with all of our hearts and all of our soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
us confess the truth of our God. And here's the question. What does Christ's resurrection mean for us? And the answer, Christ triumphed over sin and death by being physically resurrected so that all who trust in him are raised to new life in this world and to everlasting life in the world to come. Just as we will one day be resurrected, so this world will one day be restored. But those who do not trust in Christ will be raised to everlasting death. Let us continue to worship the Lord through praise.
Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you may bless this time of hearing your word as we get to know more about what kind of a Savior and Messiah you are and to learn how to respond with worship, to trust and obey you. Lord, would you open our hearts, Lord, that we may be receptive to believe in the Son who came to rescue us, his bride, the church. And may you transform us that we may become more like him in our life. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A few weeks ago, uh, Mijin and I celebrated our very first wedding anniversary. We did it something small to just have a meaningful time together. As we were looking at some of the wedding photos, we were reminded of all the good things as well as some stressful things uh, to prepare and plan out that wedding. To be fair, all the stress, ex- stressful experience that Mijin had to go through because she had to plan most of the things. And I, my role was just to affirm her decisions. I'm just really bad at planning things. And you know, there were times she would ask me, do you like these chairs or those chairs? Or these flowers or those flowers? And I would just, mm-hmm. You know, just because to me, honestly, they looked all the same and I just had to do my best to probe out what she prefers more and try to just affirm her decision. That's what I did. So Mijin did all the hard work preparing for the uh, wedding, um, but no matter how hard she worked, you know, there are things that were out of her control. You know, she can't, we can't please everyone and there are things that we can't control, things like we- uh, things like weather. Uh, the wedding was outdoor, and the crazy thing is that until the day before of our wedding day, uh, the, there were really bad thunderstorm the whole week. It was pouring, it was gloomy, it was dark. It was just really, really bad, and um, it was really frustrating for us because we almost had to relocate the wedding, wedding place, and we were depressed, we were sad, disappointed. I could see the tear coming from Yijin, and you know, we were like alerted, and we were praying, God, help us have mercy. And by God's grace, he did have mercy on us. On the day of wedding, it was actually bright, sh- sunny, and, you know, we were so thankful. We were so happy that everything went well. Well, today's passage also shows how God has re- come to rescue another wedding from this devastating situation, a crisis, a disaster that was about to come. And through this rescue, we'll learn about what kind of Savior Jesus is. We'll learn about what kind of Messiah He is, how great and awesome He is, so that we may know how to respond with worship, faith, and repentance, and obedience. So let's dive in. We see that in a small town of Cana, uh, located in Galilee, which is uh, modern-day uh, Lebanon, uh, Jesus was invited to wedding, and his mother Mary was there as well. 
And yes, wedding is a serious ceremony and a celebration today, but it was taken to a, a next level in Jesus' time. You know, wedding definitely was filled with food and drinks and dancing, but it was extended to days after days, all, sometimes almost up to a whole week. I remember um, after the celebration, feeling really tired, you know, having trying to please everyone, and I felt like a zombie, and Mijin told me her legs were killing her because she was like dropping it low, trying to pour her hearts as she was dancing during the reception. And she was like, oh, my legs, my legs. And basically, we're so tired and exhausted after just one day of celebration. But in Jesus' time, they were celebrating for a whole week, whole week. I don't know how they did it, but they really knew how to party. They really knew how to celebrate and enjoy their wedding, but also the risks were greater. And we see a problem that's happening in verse 3. It says, the wine ran out. The wine ran out. And it was a very, very big problem. It was unacceptable when there's a drinks or food that, was, that ran out. It's like inviting a guest to a special celebration at your house, like a dinner or so, and a very special occasion and you prepare plates and cups and you know utensils and you know napkins and everything and you clean up the house and you know everything is ready except for the food <laughs> there's no food for the whole night it's kind of like mockery against the mockery for the guests right i mean that's a very small example um, um, comparison to you know not having enough drinks at the wedding it was so offensive to the guests and so shameful to the families that the groom can be even sued for not having enough drinks, not having enough wine. Because, you know, usually the relative of the bride, uh, uh, the bride would sue the uh, groom for inflicting such a shame and humiliation for not preparing and causing so much shame and embarrassment to the family. It was that serious. They took it that serious. So it de was definitely a crisis, a disaster, and a wedding to be run out of wine. It definitely was embarrassment and shameful moment. It was shameful. You see, the culture was similar to like Asian culture, where they, um, it's like an honor and shame culture. These embarrassment were a serious deal to them. And just to pause here, we are all familiar with shame, the experience of being embarrassed and humiliated for some time uh, for me like sometimes I get afraid of going to a dentist not because of all the pain of drilling things through your teeth but also the shame of exposing my cavities to other people I don't know if you relate with me but um, you know shame is about exposing you know like your nakedness the things that you want to hide right guilt says this is what you've done but shame says this is who you are you're wrong, you're a failure, you're not good enough, you're a loser, you're ugly. The shame goes so deep that it controls us with fear. We tend to, we want to cover it up, right? You may put up a smile or a mask on Sunday or at work or at school or with your friends, but maybe you might be struggling with shame of sin or being sinned against, or it may not be about sin, but maybe a certain... Um, things that you went through or your family went through and you want to just hide those things because it's embarrassing. You don't want to be exposed. We are all familiar with shame. It's ugly. It's painful. And, you know, people in Jesus' time, they were very sensitive with shame. But the good news is that in today's passage, we see that our Savior, Jesus, comes not only to save us from our guilt. Yes, he did. He did but from our shame and embarrassment and our humiliation as well. As Isaiah said, Jesus came to clothe us with his salvation and righteousness. He will clothe us as his children so that we may continue to enjoy as the party, the wedding party continues. So in our passage, Jesus brings this deliverance in the crisis. And how does he do it? I'm going to first describe what's going on and explain how this, what this means and how this points to who Jesus is after. 
because you know, like his conversation with his mom and um, you know all these things, like it's kind of odd. It's kind of little, little weird. So I'm gonna just describe, just hang in there, and then I will explain after. First, we see that Jesus' mother Mary reported to Jesus that there's no more wine. But we see a very surprising response from Jesus. It's kind of odd. He said, "Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come." Imagine your mom asks you to do a chore, and you respond to her, "Woman." This ain't my business. Like, why are you telling me to do this? I'm pretty sure you're going to get into a big trouble. I'm pretty sure you're not going to be okay after that, right? So don't do that. That sounds very disrespectful. But the, Jesus wasn't trying to be disrespectful here. We must understand the cultural context. First, when Jesus said woman, it was not a irrespectful uh, thing in the culture, but it was like an endearing way of calling someone ma'am, dear madam. But he was calling his mom ma'am in a respectful way. But we do have to accept the fact that he was still giving her like a gentle rebuke, saying, what does this have to do with me? My hour, my time has not come yet. Now, what does he mean by my time or my hour? Whenever Jesus used that word, that terminology, my hour, my time, he's talking about the time, the hour, of his crucifixion, the hour that he will be crucified on the cross. And not only that, the hour that he will be glorified, the resurrection. And Mary knew. Somehow, um, she did not know how or when, but Mary knew that Jesus would manifest his glory someday. And perhaps maybe through uh, undoing this crisis, this might be a time for Jesus to reveal his glory and power. This might be the time for his glory. It might be that very hour. Who knows? Maybe Mary had thought about that. And Jesus, knew, knowing her, her heart, she was saying, this is not my hour yet. You know, Mom, my schedule, is strict, my schedule strictly follows my Father's plan. My schedule, my time, my hour, strictly follows my father's plan. And no one, else, no one else, not even you, mom, can tell me what my time is, when my hour is. Not even my closest disciple, Peter, when Peter was trying to manipulate that hour going on the cross, Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan, rebuking him very harshly because he was very stern and firm about his mission and his hour and his time. So that's why Jesus kind of gently rebuked Mary. This is not the time yet. And I, again, I'm going to explain why in the world this conversation, this odd conversation is placed right there, right? And everything is intentional for John. And so Mary kind of brushed off uh, this gentle rebuke and told the servants, listen to whatever Jesus said. Listen to whatever he said, okay? She, she trusted Jesus. She knew Jesus will save the day. So she told the servants, just listen to whatever he said. So Jesus told the servants to fill six stone jars with water. These earthen jars were made out of stone to prevent any contamination because they had to be used uh, for um, cleansing ritual. They had to be clean. If you remember, like these Korean pots, like hanari, like these big pots from you know old days, really big earthen jars that people used to um, uh, uh, store like you know soy sauce or bean paste or even rice or other food, they used those special jars to keep them from being contaminated. So these ancient wisdom, the Jews used also uh, these jars for cleansing ritual, to keep the water clean from being contaminated because they, it was for the sake of cleansing, uh, symbolically, ritually. But for example, one of the rituals were called the Day of Atonement. If you guys heard you know, the term Yom Kippur, right? Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Basically, there was a time when Aaron, the priest, would come and he would lay his hand on an animal, uh, usually a goat. He would lay and he would pray out all the sin and guilt and all the evil that God's people have committed. So he will just pray all those things and he will send off the goat into the wilderness, into the desert, so that the goat will be lost, will be hungry and thirsty and eventually die. 
It's actually a sacrificial animal for the sins of God's people. And then immediately what they would do is they would bring that jar, that earthen jar, uh, filled with water, and they would wash their hands in the jar for the purification sake. So by washing, it symbolizes that they were cleansed of their sin. It's about cleansing their sin. And Jesus used these cleansing jars to save the wedding. Jesus used these cleansing water that symbolized um, cleansing people's sin and turned it into wine for people to enjoy. Interesting. And he did turn it, and they tasted it and rejoiced. They, they were like, wow, this is good. You know, usually people bring out the um, good wine in the beginning, and then they bring out the poor after a while, but, you know, this is like the best wine I've ever had, Jesus. I mean, so it was interesting, you know, how Jesus, you know, turned the water into wine, threw this water in the jar, but what, so what? The question is, what does it all have to do with anything? You know, his talk with Mary and his, you know, turning the water into wine, yes, he saved the day, and so the bridegroom is now, you know, no longer ashamed or humiliated. Now he's, you know, he's receiving all the honor and, you know, respect from the people. But what do they have to do with anything? First of all, we know that this the story of wedding is not just a random story of a wedding just placed in, in this Gospel of John, but this wedding is actually a foreshadow. It, it's supposed to point to an ultimate wedding that is to come. And Jesus is the ultimate bridegroom who came to rescue his people, his bride, the church, by his sacrificing himself. As it says in Revelation 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. This is like the celebration of the wedding feast because of the marriage of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and his bride, the church, has made herself ready that they will come. And in Revelation 21, 2 says, we, the believers, as bride, are adorned with wedding dress, symbolically, waiting for the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, to come, and he will dwell with us forever, and we will dwell with him forever. That is the very purpose of God's creation for his people, so that he may be united to us and spend eternity with us in joy and celebration of this wedding feast. And that day is coming. And in order for that day to come and make it happen, Jesus had to come the first time to pay the penalty, pay the cost of that waiting. And now how does he do it? In order that we may eat and drink and the celebration of ultimate wedding with our Savior, Jesus had to go through that hour, that time, the hour that he mentioned to Mary. So that wedding at Cana was just a, just one example, one one like like a, a glimpse uh, that points to the ultimate wedding. So in order for that ultimate wedding to happen, Jesus had to face that hour, that time, when his body would be broken for our sin, when his blood would be spilled on the cross. So he was still hinting that very time, even at that very wedding at Cana. And although in the old days, God's people once cleansed themselves in the water in the earthen jars after sacrificing an animal, but now, in the new covenant, in the new era, in the new age, Jesus replaced that water with good wine at the time, which symbolizes his blood that was spilled for us to wash our past, present, future sins, guilt, and shame completely once and for all. As the hymn goes, my sin not in part, but the whole has been nailed to the cross. That's why Jesus had to come to pay for that wedding, to bring about the new age to come. So we no longer have to go through that ritual and sacrifice and going to somewhere else. But he became the ultimate sacrifice. He became the ultimate washing water through his blood that was spilled for us that we may be forgiven, that our shame may be covered, that we may be redeemed and renewed and adopted as children of God and now united with Jesus Christ, our Savior. So turning this water into wine at a wedding points to 
Jesus Christ dying on the cross, shedding his blood so that we may enjoy the ultimate wedding with him. We may drink the cup of joy and celebration because he drank the cup of wrath, because he spilled his own blood. We can eat the true bread of life because his body was broken. On uh, in Lord's Supper, we have bread and wine signifying our union with Jesus, the celebration with Jesus, to break the bread and to drink of the cup, but that was only possible because Jesus shed his blood. Jesus was broken. That's what it means by this wedding canna, turning water into wine for Jesus. So we learn that that is who Christ is. He's our Savior who came to bring us, rescue us, unite us, to, to marry us so that we can celebrate this great news, this great salvation with Christ. So then how should we respond to that Savior? How do we respond to him? Two things. We trust and we obey. We trust and we obey. Verse 11 says, After Jesus did his signs at Cana in Galilee, disciples believed in him. They believed in him. So all the signs that Jesus was showing was intended for our faith. Jesus did all these signs in order that we may see and know who Jesus is and believe in him. Let me unpack that a little bit. Let me explain what those signs mean a little bit, how they are supposed to be for our faith. John mentions seven signs in the Gospel of John. And what, and what does sign mean? He used the word sign. It's very special for the Gospel of John. These signs are the miraculous works or the wondrous works of Jesus, like turning water into wine, multiplying the bread, healing the sick, even raising the dead. This, these are miracles, but what's really important is what are they for? What are their purpose? They're to point to the identity of Jesus as the Messiah. These signs and miracles affirm and point to who Jesus is. I watched a show called um, Britain's Got Talent on YouTube sometime, and I think everyone knows this guy. Like, if you don't know, you can kind of like look him up. His name is Paul Potts. Like, you guys know him? Like, the, 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 the guy who, like, sings opera is really good, you know. Uh, but he, if you just look at him, like, in his appearance, he just looks like your average next-door guy. And I heard that his dad is a bus driver. His mom is cashier at supermarket. And he was working at carpet warehouse. And nobody thinks anything special of him. He was not educated. He didn't learn or study anything, like, about music or arts, you know, anything to like, you know, perform in that platform. But he came out to Britain's Got Talent and standing out in front of Judge, like you guys know, Simon Cowell and, you know, other, other guys, and they didn't look that interested in him. Maybe the judges are tired after a long day of, you know, judging the contestors, and they're not expecting, you could tell, they're not expecting much out of him. And as soon as Paul opened his mouth, sing an opera. As soon as he started singing, like that immediate second, as soon as it happens, the judges were stunned at the sheer talent that he had. The audience were, they all rose up from their, you know, seats and they were clapping. Some of them were crying because, you know, his singing really touched their hearts and they were just so moved and touched. You know, immediately he became a sensational star after that night. So at the moment of his performance, it proved everything about him. They all knew it. They, they said he was a diamond. They knew that he was the next Britain's idol. They knew him. It pointed to something about him. And when Jesus performed his miracle, like turning water into wine, it screamed out, yes, Jesus is. Was born in nowhere like Nazareth, and it was born under you know teenage girl Mary, and it looked like a homeless guy. And Isaiah said there was nothing special, impressive about his appearance. Yet, those signs scream out, this is the long-awaited Messiah. This is the Son of God you've been waiting for. This is your Savior. This is your Lord and Savior, the Messiah, who came to save you. And as we behold who Jesus is through these signs, we're supposed to believe. We're supposed to behold and believe and put our faith and trust in him as the disciples did. 
And even John himself said, these things are written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in him. That's the purpose. What's the purpose of, you know, Jesus coming here to show all these signs and miracles and wonders? To reveal who he is so that we may believe and trust in him. So the question is, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? He is the Son of God. He is your Savior and Lord. I'm not talking about whether your parents believe in him or your friends believe in him. I'm not talking about if you're familiar with Jesus, familiar with you know, Christianity, or you speak Christianese, you're familiar with the message. I'm asking you, do you have a personal faith, a personal relationship with Jesus? Because it depend, your, your eternity depends on it. Do you believe in Jesus? When you hear these words, when you look to Christ and behold Jesus, do you trust in him? If you haven't, I want to invite you to come, look to him, and trust in Jesus. Put your faith in him. And lastly, and secondly, how do we respond to our Savior, the Messiah? Obedience. We obey and follow him. We're not saved by obedience. We're not saved by how much we obey or how much we fail to obey or disobey. Uh, but we're saved by our faith, right? By believing and trusting in him. However, if you truly believe, it must produce, that faith must produce an ongoing obedient lifestyle, ongoing growth of obedience. You know, we're not perfect. Sometimes you go into seasons of disobedience and ups and downs, but it's supposed to lead you to grow in obedience. Look at verse 5. It says, Mary said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever Jesus tells you. Whatever. Notice that she didn't say, if you have some time, if you have, you know, if you feel like it, you know, if you have all the means and circumstances work out, then, then you can obey him. That's not what, you, what Mary said. It says, whatever Jesus said, go and obey him. Whatever he says, regardless of your preference, your circumstances, your interest, go and obey him. Because you trust because obedience is a product of our faith of our trusting in our savior we trust we obey because we trust that god is good we trust in his character in his word and if sometimes even if we don't understand why he's calling us to do certain things why he's commanding us we obey we follow because we trust in him it is Lack of faith that leads us to disobedience, actually. Remember, Adam and Eve disobeyed God because of their lack of trust in God. They thought that maybe God was withholding all the good things from them. You know, this, this thing, this fruit, looks good. Looks like it's going to make me happy. It looks like it's going to make me like God. But man, God must be withholding all the good stuff just for himself. He doesn't want me to really be happy. So they didn't trust him. They didn't trust his character. They didn't trust his word. And so they disobeyed. Lack of faith leads into disobedience. And as we trust in God more and more, in his character and his word, it will lead us to obey him more. And ultimately, we trust him and we obey him because he is our Lord. You know, as we learn about who Jesus is in the Gospel of John, we're going to learn about how he came to save us. Yes, that's true. But we will learn about his divine nature. That's the emphasis that John constantly reminds us. This is the Son of God. This is your Lord and Master. That's why Mary said, do whatever he tells you to do, signifying Jesus is your Lord and you are as our servants. What do servants do? They listen and obey whatever the master says. And that same calling is the same calling for us, you and me. Jesus is not just a Savior, but also Lord. You know, salvation comes from trusting Jesus, yes. But it comes from trusting Jesus as both a Savior and Lord. You can't pick and choose which one you want. You can't separate Jesus and say, okay, I like this part about Jesus. You know, I like how he came and he loved me and he... 
came to die for me so that I'm, I can get out of trouble and I can be in heaven. You know, these are great things. He loves me. Wow, awesome. But I don't like this part where he's my Lord and I have to give up my own desire and right at times and I have to trust in him and I have to, I have to obey whatever he says even when I don't want to or when I don't understand. I don't like that part. I want to still be the Lord of my life, the master of my life. I'll take the Savior part. I don't want to take the Lord part. And that's just not how it works when you say you believe in Jesus. If, if that's how you believe in him, you probably do not know him or do not have a saving faith in him. We can pick apart Jesus. We're supposed to receive him as both the Savior and Lord. Just remember, you know, he came to give all of himself to you, sacrificing himself, as, even as we learn today. He had to come, shed his own blood so that you can enjoy, not to take away all the good things, not to withhold all the good things, but so that God can give you the best of the best at the cost of his own life, at the cost of his own son's life. Would you not want to then trust in him and obey and follow that kind of savior? Would you not want to receive him as your master and Lord to take you to wherever he leads you? I want to encourage you. Let's receive Jesus as who he is and believe in him as who he is, as the Lord and Savior of our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and thank you for the reminder of your son as our Savior and Lord how he came to rescue us, how he came to rescue us from our sin, our guilt, and shame. That he, and he has shown his sign so that we may see him and know him and believe in him and respond with faith and obedience. Father, would you remind us more and more of the beauty and the glory of Christ so that it may lead us closer and closer to him and that we may live a life of faith and obedience. For we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is time for the offering. So let's give with willing and cheerful heart.
Father, we thank you for this time of offering uh, as we are reminded once again about the great gift that you have given us through your Son. And Lord, as we are um, beholding or who he is and what he has done on the cross, Lord, we want to respond with uh, this time of giving ourselves as well. Lord, you are worthy, Lord, of all our devotion, all our obedience, Lord, all our lives to be committed to you. So would you receive um, and would you be pleased, Lord? I want to uh, continue to pray, Lord, for our nation as we are still struggling, Lord, with this pandemic. And um, would you uh, quicken the vaccination and everyone would um, that pro go through that process uh, quickly and safely and people would grow in immunity and things will start to come, uh, come back to normal we also pray, Lord, for uh, the nation uh, in a way that you would bring 
uh, uh, bring humility to our people and you will bring unity rather than division and hostility that we will come together uh, in this time to fight and to care for one another. Would you be with the leaders of our nation to bring them wisdom and their heart for the people so that they will selflessly lead and guide and govern as you lead them, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is time for the offering on the EM side. Uh, please make sure to sign up at cfanem.org or on the CFAN Facebook group uh, in order to attend Sunday service each week. And also, uh, January through February, Bibles are available, daily Bibles. So if you haven't picked them up, if you want one, please pick them up for five bucks. And um, congregation meeting is today at 12.10 uh, p.m., right after this, right now, in the KM Chapel, and the Zoom link is also available. And also, uh, the community group uh, will kick off on Wednesday this week, um, on February 3rd. Uh, CG leaders will be reaching out to you this week. And if you've never joined a CG before but would like to try one, please contact Julia at the uh, email right there. And yeah, we would really want you to come out and be connected and be encouraged and to grow together. More on the youth group. Sunday Bible School is today at 2 p.m. And Friday Hangout is today, uh, this Friday at 8 p.m. That's it for the announcements. Let's close with the closing praise. Over a thousand tongues to sing My great Redeemer's praise The glories of my God and King The triumphs of Oh, please to 
time with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever. Amen. You see the benediction? Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.